around the park in Amherst that I live, Amherst Township. So it wasn't very fast, but I survived it. So. Yeah, right, right. It does not seem that long ago. And it does not seem that long ago when, like, I was wondering, like, am I going to be able to drive, like, for my summer classes and, and all that. So I, I guess that's the, the best, uh, you know, we can hope for. Ridgeville, are you there? Ridgeville, are you there? Could be. I know you used to be in Ridgeville, right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you're here now, so we're down to just one person on the Ridgeville campus. Right. Oh, something happened. Are you there, Ridgeville? There you are. All right. Excellent. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, let me call our control people and see. Yeah, Ridgeville can hear but not, or I'm sorry, can see but not hear me. <coughs> okay. Yes, it is. Uh, not that I know of.
Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a dead mic. They're going to come and fix it. In the meantime, I actually had thought about this. I can share my screen with you. Okay. So what I will do is I will share my screen with you, and that might help you be able to see um, that. So here we go. All right. All right, um, last time we went over the uh, an basic anatomy of uh, an uh, application, an Android application, and the one piece that we were missing was the code, and that's what we're going to be getting into this time. Um, we looked to see all the resource files and all the files associated with it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to expand on that. We're going to revisit them and review them for this new application, and then we are going to um, look at um, the coding and see how that goes. This will also serve as a brief intro slash review of Java for those of you that ha have or have not done Java before. <coughs> so this should be beneficial. So the application we're going to do <coughs> is going to be a tip calculator. And there's a tip calculator that's with the Deedle. Uh, uh, book, but there's also a tip calculator um, that uh, I, I wrote that's sort of a simplified version of it. So I'm going to run that and we'll take a look at it and depending on time we'll get through the tip calculator and we'll get through the uh, other tip calculator. Alright, so let me run the tip calculator and show you how it behaves. So I have my tablet here. Let me Click on my example. The code is available for download, by the way, in Angel. If you want to go back and view that, I can run it as an Android app. Again, it gives me a choice of whether I want to run it on my actual physical device or um, <clears throat> through the emulator. I click OK. And here is the tip calculator. And we'll take a look at it. There are three things to this, four labels actually. There is a simple tip calculator title. There is a text box. There is a drop down. And then there's finally there's a button to calculate. Now again, nothing earth shattering at all. But this is going to uh, introduce something that we're going to be doing all the time from now on. So it's something that. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at. So if I go in here and I can put in the amount of the meal. Now notice, as we look in this, that only the numeric fields are available to it. Notice that the alphabetical um, characters are blocked out on my keyboard because, and again, we'll see how that is done <coughs> when you define the text box. So I can put in, let's say the meal was $56, and let's say my service was average. I can calculate tip, and it says that is $8.40. All right. I could also go in and say um, if the service was poor, $0, and finally if it was excellent, $11.20. Yeah, I Okay. See, we don't sit around waiting. We, we fire up Skype, and we're talking to them via Skype. You know, we're, we're prepared for every eventuality that could possibly happen. So I actually, in one of those bags, I have a little hand generator. So if the power went out, i just crank it up, and we'll run via that. So, okay, I exaggerate a little bit, but you get the idea. All right. So that's the basics of this guy. And when we look at the uh, Deedle example, the Deedle example has more stuff in it, and, and we'll see that. But I think this is a good place to start. I want to want to sort of um,
Is that better? Can you hear me through the normal means? No? Okay. All right. He's saying he's not hearing it through that? No. So anyhow, we'll, um, I'm just going to continue with Skype. I don't know if, if you guys think you can get it worked out. That would be great. All right. Okay. So let's start by looking at the files that we saw last time. And these are in the resource files. We will have, again, the drawable, which is our little icon. We have three versions of it again. And the three versions correspond to high density, medium density, and low density based on those ratios. We won't talk about that again, but what that guarantees is that guarantees that the icons are approximately the same size regardless of the, the physical device. We then have a layout folder that has our XML for the layout. And finally, we have our strings value. Strings value, as we saw before, has all these different hard-coded strings that we used. It's about the same as the one we used before with one little difference. And that is the little difference is we have a string array, actually, for levels of service. Again, that corresponds to that drop where we have the three choices, poor, average, and excellent. So other than that, we have our basic strings like we had before under resources. String name, a hello for simple string, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, simple tip calculator. String name, app name called example, simple tip calculator. String name, calculate, calculate tip. That's the text that's on the button. We have a string array for our drop down. And then we have a prompt for the drop down that says level of service. Choose level of service. All right. The advantage of that is that we could easily localize this application by going in and uh, just creating a second set of uh, string uh, values for uh, some other uh, language. All right. So any questions about this? The big difference, again, is that we have a string array instead of a string, and in addition, rather, to the regular strings that we had last time. All right, let's look at the UI now. Let's look at the layout file before we get into the code. Again, the layout file and the strings files are all XML files. The layout file... We have similar to what we saw before, but there's a handful of differences. First of all, do you remember what layout we had before? This one is a linear layout. Do you remember what was in the um, little welcome application? That was a relative layout. So relative layout, you position things in relation to other things on the page. So you say this is to the right of it, this is to the left of it, and so on down the line. There's several choices as far as the layout goes, linear being one of them, um, and relative being the other. A linear layout is where the things simply bloop, 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 go down one after another. All right? Um, it can be oriented horizontally or it can be oriented vertically. All right, this one is oriented vertically. Phil um, when I say orient vertically, I don't mean this way. When I say orient vertically, what I mean is first control, underneath it's the second control, underneath it's the third control, underneath it's the fourth control. So if I rotate on its side, 
is still that way, even if, even if the thing is, is in landscape, it's going to be those controls are, are oriented uh, uh, vertically or horizontally. Yes. Yes, you could. And, and there, there are table layouts. There's a lot of complexity you can have with layouts. I believe you can nest it in that way, but there's enough. You can do some nesting of layouts, and I believe you could nest that particular one that you mentioned if you wanted to have things like that. A very common thing is like, and, and I might be mistaken, but I think their tip, uh, tip calculator uses a table layout, which is a pretty common layout as well. All right, first thing on our page is text view. Fill parent means give as much space, or I'm sorry, wrap content means give it as much space as it needs. Fill parent uh, means it goes all the way across. The text of this comes from at string hello, which means where is it getting the string from? Where is it getting the value of this from? From that resource file. And again, it's smart enough to know to use the appropriate resource file. So. If we had multiple languages, it would use the proper language depending on the setting on the individual Android device. But it looks under hello, and it uses that. All right. This text view doesn't have an ID associated with it. You notice the rest of them we're going to see, I think, have an ID associated with it. Why is there no ID associated with this text view? Why do you think? There's no need to access it in the code. In other words, this is simply a label. We're going to set it, and we're done with it. We don't really need to manipulate it at all. Whereas the edit text field that's underneath it, where we put the dollar amount um, of the meal, and the button, and the label underneath that, where we are going to put the results for the tip, those are all things that we're going to want our program to be able to know about. All right? We need to pull the value from the text box. We need to be able to understand that the button has been pressed, so we need to do some code. And lastly, we need to put the results in their proper place. So therefore, we need to access and manipulate those other controls, whereas this one, we don't really need to touch. It's a label. There it is. We forget about it. So there's no ID on this one. Underneath it is edit text. It does have an ID and has an ID of amount. This at plus simply indicates that this is the first time we're referencing it. This is a new ID that we're talking about. We're not referencing to some other old ID. All right. AMT is the name of it. The layout width is in 100 dp, so that is data independent pixels. Oh, I'm sorry, density independent pixels. So um, just like the images, it will be scaled properly depending on whether you're talking about a high or a low density. Wrap content gives means give it as much space as it needs. Android input type is a number which is why, if you remember when we looked at it, we uh, could only put numbers in. We could not put numbers and letters. Then finally, request focus is a tag that indicates that we want the focus to go to this guy. So we're asking Android to give this guy the focus. And unless Android has a good reason not to, it will give it the focus. All right. Keep in mind, all these things are part of the Android framework. In other words, I didn't make these up, and I didn't make up these values for it. Uh, over time, we'll learn some of these, and if there's something that you want to do that isn't covered, you can always look up to see what some of the other attributes are. The next thing we have is a spinner control. <clears throat> and a spinner control is uh, another name, or the name that's used in Android for a uh, um, a uh, drop down. It's where you have to you have the ability to choose between a, a list of predefined values, finite predefined values. We had a service. Uh, I'm sorry. We had the ID of service to it. 
We set the width and height, fill parent, wrap content. The entries come from that array. So remember we talked about in the strings file before, we always had at strings. In this particular case, we have uh, at array, level of service. So we don't have to code anything for depending on how many values are in that array, that's how many items will appear in this drop-down list. And then finally, the prompt appears with the drop-down when we select it. So again, let's, let's look at this. We have our three string files in the array. If we were to look at the drop-down for this, the spinner control, choose level of service, that is my prompt. And the three values underneath it, poor, average, and excellent, come from the strings file, that string array that I had. So far, so good. Nothing earth-shattering about the last two things. We have a button that has an ID, has text, and so on. And then finally, we have a text view that is there for the result. So initially, it has no value, and our code will give it the value. So we're using a couple different controls in here. We have a text view, which we've seen those before in the previous example. We have an edit text, which we have not seen. We have a spinner, which we have not seen. And we have a button, which we have not seen. Notice many of these, uh, many of these attributes they have in common. All of these, these controls have the ability to add an ID associated with them. You can specify the width, you can specify the height, and so on. All right, so now we're ready to look at the code. And the code we're going to look at will be this example Java class. Now at this point, this is where we are going to review how this works Android-wise and also have a bit of a Java review or introduction. All right. First off on the list, we have a package. And again, if you remember, you separate your source code, your Java source code into, or you separate your Java code into packages. And you typically use the reverse URL notation, so in this case, edu, Lorraine CCC. And this, oddly enough, is not CISS 268. This is CISS 265, but live and learn. All right. I then have a series of import statements. Import statements fully qualify the class names that you're referring to. In other words, it tells what class I actually mean. Over here in the code, for example, I have activity. Now this activity is the activity class that lives in the Android framework called Android App Activity. That's the package that that guy lives in, that that class lives in. Likewise with bundle, with view, with button, with spinner, with text, and edit text. All those live in the appropriate packages that correspond to the Android framework. Now, if we think about it, <clears throat> I could, let's say I was making a online Monopoly game, or not Monopoly, what's a game where you, where you spin a little spinner? Sorry, let's say. Let's pretend it is, even if it isn't. I might have my own spinner control that's different from the Android spinner control. 
In which case, I would put my package names in front of it if I wanted to use my spinner control. The idea here is you have two choices when you use classes from another package. You can import, that is, tell the compiler where to find these classes, or every time you refer to that class, you could type in app.app.activity. So, in the interest of making the code a little cleaner and in saving some typing time, we import. Now, Eclipse is smart enough if you start referring to a class and you haven't imported the package, it will kind of tip you off and say, hey, uh, maybe you forgot to import that package. And then you can go and, and click on it and it will do it for you. So now, for the activity, I don't have to refer to android.app.activity. I've told it that the activity class I'm interested in lives in android.app. And likewise, all these other. Now, you're going to always have, with your Android app, an activity. An activity roughly is corresponding to giving the user one view of something. All right? And so therefore, I am extending activity into my activity, which is called example activity. What does it mean in Java when we extend a class? You're inheriting. All right? What's it mean to inherit from a class? Exactly. When you inherit a class from another class, you get everything that's in the main class, in the parent class, plus you can have some things of your own. The class analogy they always give in, um, in uh, object-oriented textbooks or Java classes is, you know, they talk about living things, you know. You could create an inherent structure of living things, you know, where at the top there'd be living thing, there'd be plant and animal. Under animal there could be bird and amphibian and reptiles and mammals. Under mammals there could be dogs and cats and people and so on. <laughs> Under dogs, there could be German shepherds, uh, pit bulls, uh, poodles, and so on down the line. Now, that forms like a hierarchy. And the thing to keep in mind is that a poodle is a dog. So a poodle will have all the characteristics and all the behaviors that a dog will have. A poodle is a dog. It's also a mammal. It's also an animal. It's also a living thing. So there's some default behavior about what happens when you open up an activity, what happens when you create an activity, and so on, that we don't have to code, because that's coded in the ancestors. And that's really the big win for this. We don't have to describe and put all the code in our examples, because there's already some of the framework code that exists in the ancestor classes, we can just extend it and customize it to do the thing specific for us. So, on create saved instance bundle, that allows you to restore an app that has been, um, that you've gone away from and so on. We'll come back to that probably later in the semester. I want to start here. Set content view r.layout.main. Can someone explain to me in just regular language what that is doing? Set content view r.layout.main. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, taking, it's taking the file from the main XML file and it's using that to be the main view for this application, the content view. So that becomes the, quote, screen of the application. This effectively is bringing that to life. Previously, we had a layout. This actually takes the layout that's defined in the XML and actually makes all those controls and makes all those objects and draws them on the screen. So this line, and we'll see this in virtually every, or probably every, application that we look at is going to take our XML file 
and expand it or explode it or however you want to put it. Turn it from just an XML description of the layout and creating the actual screen. R comes from resources. It's under resources, under layout, main. Ah, the next one. Who'd have thought we're going to spend so much time on one line? All right. Button calc equals parenthesis. Find view by ID r.id.calc. Let's make sure we understand it. And we'll understand it by looking at both sides of the equal sign. All right. We'll look at the left side first, then we'll look at the right side. We're going to see instructions like this in every example that we go over. So it's important that you understand it. All right? Button.calc. Oh, I'm sorry, not button.calc. Button calc equals. What that is, is that saying I have a variable of type button, and I'm defining that variable as type button, and I'm setting the value of that variable to whatever is on the right side of the equal sign. Simple assignment statement. All right. It's a little bit different because the variable calc is known as an object reference variable. All right. In Java, there's two kinds of variables. Here's where the review is going to come in. There's two kinds of variables in Java. There are primitives and there are object references. All right. Primitives are simple. An int and a boolean <coughs> are examples of primitives. An int is a variable that simply holds an integer. A boolean is a variable that simply holds a true or false. If I do a statement like this, it should say j equals i, in Java, that's taking the value of this variable and storing it in that variable. All right? So now, if, if I have code where I say i equals 1, j equals 2, i equals j, j equals 3. When I'm done, i is going to have a value of 2 and j is going to have a value of 3 because I've been copying values. Think of these variables as memory locations and I'm putting values in. So I declare i and j is integers. I say i equals 1. The memory location that has a name of i gets, contains an integer 1. Second line, there's a memory location called j, gets a value of 2. If I say i equals j, I take the value of that memory location and I store it in the value of i's location. And then finally, if I say j equals 3, I take this value and store it in the memory location named j. So when I'm done, it has 2 and 3. That's how primitives work. All right? Any questions about that? That should be pretty clear if you've done C sharp or anything like that before. Object references are different than that. So a button 
is not a primitive. A button is a class. All right? And therefore, if I define button class equals something, I'm actually storing in the memory location name calc, I'm actually storing a pointer to where that class lives, not the values of the class itself. So things work a little bit different, all right, in the case of object references. Let's say I have a customer class. And I have a customer object. An object is a specific instance of a class. So a customer class is everything about generic customers, whereas a is a template for customers. If I create a new customer, I might be creating the, for customer Jones or customer Smith, a specific instance of that. If I create a new object via the new command, it is put in a spot in memory called the heap. Now primitives, as their name implies, are simple. An integer is simply an integer, right? It has a value. A boolean is simply a boolean. It can be true or false. A customer could contain a bunch of different attributes. You could have the customer's name, you could have the customer's address, you could have the customer's phone number. You have a whole bunch of things associated with a customer. So to store it, it's a little more complicated. It gets put in a particular location of Java's memory called the heap. And then the variables contain a pointer to that. And if I do an assignment statement, d equals c, what I'm actually doing is I'm copying the pointer, which is like a memory location, from c to d. So both of these would point to the same. So if I change the customer name on d, guess what? C also gets that value changed. We'll come back to this throughout the semester. The key thing to remember is primitive store values, object references store pointers to objects. And anything you do with an object reference, you're dealing with the pointer. You're passing the pointer in a function. You're returning a pointer, <coughs> excuse me, when you call a function. All right? So, getting back to our example, we have button calc equals something. What that thing is, hey, I have an object reference called calc that I want to set to be pointed to some object on the heap. All right? Well, which object do we want? Well, we want the object that corresponds to <coughs> this guy in, in the XML file. So let's rewind and think this through for a second. In our code, this statement, oops, this statement brings that layout to life. It creates that view, and it creates all the views on that view. So it creates the text edit object. It creates the edit text object. It creates the button object. It creates the other text edit object. So it creates all those objects. But we want to code based on those objects. 
And for us to code, we need to be able to point and say, this is the guy I want to use. All right? That's where the second half of this comes in. Find view by ID simply says, hey, I want this variable called calc to point to something in that UI. What thing do I want it to point to? I want it to point to the thing that has an ID of calc. So we're using the ID in the code to establish that connection between our variable and the object that was created when we create when we use that XML file to set the main content view. All right. If any of you have done JavaScript uh, with HTML, there's a get element by ID. It does just about the exact same thing. Get element by ID says find the thing on the page that has this ID. That's what I'm interested in. Well, find view by ID says look at my layout and find the thing that has this as the ID. That's what I'm interested in. Yes. Yes, this is all case sensitive. Absolutely. So, I have a variable that's of type button and I want to set it, that variable, to point to that object that, is that was created by this statement and is part of this application's user interface. Now, the last part that we haven't looked at is this part, where there's button in parentheses. What is that doing? That is casting, all right? Find view by ID is a function that can return any kind of view. It doesn't just return buttons. There's a function, find view by ID. You give it an ID it finds the corresponding view within the user interface. Now that corresponding view can be a spinner, it can be a text edit or an edit uh, text field, it can be a text field, it can be an image, it can be all sorts of different views. But it's going to return the view, a pointer to that view. Now, we however have to treat that view as though it's a button because we want to take advantage of the properties and behaviors that are built into a button. So we've rigged the deck a little bit. Yeah, this function could return any kind of view, but we know because we're the guy that made the UI that our ID calc is a button. So what this does is this says, hey, I know that that's a view, but let's treat that view like a button, because I know it's a button, all right? So take, and we're going to treat it as a button, and we're going to store a pointer to it in this button variable. Then we can do button things to it. We can address its button properties and its button behaviors. Without that, it would have no idea what kind of view it was, and we could only treat or we could only access and manipulate the very generic properties that every view has in common. Which means we couldn't do much with it. So, we're going to see instructions like this over and over and over again. What we're doing is, we're creating a variable, we're creating our hook to access and manipulate the stuff that's on the user interface. How are we doing that? Well, after we set the content view, we find the subviews, we find the views on that view using their ID, we cast them then to the appropriate data type, and last but not least, we store that value in a variable of whatever type that class is or that object is so that we can manipulate it. Questions about that? That's a mouthful, I know. The bottom line is, and again, you should understand how this works, but the bottom line is, when we're done, calc points to that button on the screen, so now we can program it. Yes? 
I, th I thought he was talking to the, there looks like there's a person there. Do you have a question in Ridgeville? Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, they're, they're debugging whatever issues they're having there. So, okay. All right. <clears throat> so the bottom line is when we're done, we can do button things to it. All right, we know it's a button now, and we have a variable, and we can address that button control to do button things to it. Well, what do you do with a button? You click it. All right. So, first thing we're going to do is we are going to tell the button what to do when it gets clicked. All right. Tell the button what to do when it gets clicked. That's what set on click listener means. That means that we're going to tell the button what to do. We're going to tell that calc button specifically what to do when you get clicked. All right. Now, an on-click listener is an object itself. All right. Yes. Um, I, we, can, we can look at it. Um, again, uh, this is a little bit of a, tr a tricky snippet of code, so we'll talk about it. In general, the brackets indicate containment, that this is a chunk of code. Well, when and, I first saw this, I, you know, I was looking at it, and I'm like, okay, that's, you're calling the set on click listener, you're calling the on click listener, but then you have the on click method. I didn't realize that the actual on click method was part of the constructor for the on click listener. Yes. Uh, the way you have this right now. Well, again, so that's all, that's just uh, again, uh, you are for, you know, um, the only thing I would request is that you, you take some care and you do it in a consistent way. So, yeah, um, if you have a quibble with that, um, what would you prefer, this being on its own line? or? That's the way I'm used to it myself. Because so, then that, that to me says, okay, then this next body of okay. this method is actually part of the constructor. Okay. I can I can do that. All right. That's just my preference. All right. No problem. All right. At any rate, getting back to this, the on-click listener of a button itself is an object. What kind of object is it? It's an on-click listener. All right. That's the type of object it is. Now, we're going to see throughout this course a couple ways that we can create an on-click listener. This is what is called an anonymous class because we're not creating a, a class and giving it a name. We're simply building within this setting of it. It's like, yeah, I want an on-click listener and here is the on-click function that goes with it. So this creates an object and associates it with the button and says, when you click on that button, this listener's on-click event is going to happen, which effectively is this code here. You'd have to call this on-click, yes. And you'd have to pass it the parameter of view, uh, a single argument. Keep in mind the on-click listener and the framework works together because this is that, you know, because this is an on-click listener, it knows to look for an on-click method. If you had another method, <clears throat> it wouldn't know to associate that with the clicking of it. 
So, in effect, I'm telling it what to do when we click this button. I'm setting the listener. And this listener is this class that I'm creating this way, which is called an anonymous class, that contains a on-click event, or on-click method, rather, that does its thing. All right. What is it that we do when we, when we um, click that button? Well, we actually do the calculation, and we display the results. Now, this being an object-oriented world and trying to develop and cultivate good practices, I'm calling the rule for calculating a tip, I'm calling that my business logic. And that shouldn't belong in this code. It should belong separated. So I created a separate meal class for my tip calculation that we'll come to in a minute. But I'm creating one of those. So when I click on it, I create a meal object. And I'm going to ask that meal how much of a tip there should be, as opposed to having that code all wrapped up in here. Now. <laughs> The next thing we see is three statements that look virtually identical to that button statement that we had before. The difference being is they're for different classes. We have an edit text, a text view, and a spinner. And therefore, we do a find view by ID and cast the result in the first case as an edit text, in the second case as a text view and in the third case, as a spinner. So now we have three variables that point to those other three controls on our user interface. I can then ask for the value from that text box using this instruction. I can set some properties on my meal object, I can set the cost, and I can set the quality of service. I can then calculate the tip by calling the tip method on my meal class, my meal object. And I can take that tip, and I can set the result back in there. Now, we haven't talked about the meal object yet. I'm going to leave that one go for a while. We'll, we can come back to that in a bit. What I want you to get an understanding of, though, is like the, before we do more of the object oriented D kind of things with the meal uh, class and object, I want to make sure that you understand the Android y parts of this. All right? The Android parts of this involve, again, setting the content view, displaying the screen. Refer to one of those objects that get created as part of the user interface by using the find view by ID. Which we then cast because we want to treat it, in this case, like a button, or in the other case, like an edit text or whatever. We have to cast it so that we know that that's the type of thing it really is. So at this point, we've popped up our screen, we've created all the views on our screen, and we are now having a variable called calc, which is a button that points to the, click, the, the button that we click on the screen here. So that's where we are up to this point. At this point, we're telling that button, because we know calc's a button, buttons have on-click listeners as one of the properties that are built in to a button object. All right? That's defined in the Android framework. One of the things that has an on-click listener. So we're, we're setting the on-click listener. We're telling this button 
what to do or who's going to handle what to do when you get clicked. And it is this brand new, quote, anonymous class that I'm creating here. And I'm defining as part of that class the onClick event, which is the actual code that's going to execute when that button gets clicked. This button creates a meal class, points to the edit view, spinner view, and text view, gets some values from those views, calls the meal class, to calculate the tip, then finally takes the result and sets the text view that contains the results with the answer that it got back. Any questions on this? Let's spend a little time looking at the meal class. The meal class is effectively my business rules. You see this in all forms of software development where you separate stuff into components. And Android is a great example of separating stuff into components so that to change something you can address one component without having to worrying about anything else. So for example, maybe I would want to do this tip calculation or other aspects of a meal in several places in my application. I therefore create a custom class for it that will handle everything that I need to know about a meal. And the only thing I'm really interested in in this case is the tip calculation. So I have my class. It appears in the same package. The class has two attributes, a cost and a level of service. Again, if I was doing a full-blown one of these, I'd have a lot more attributes. I make these private because good programming practice states that attributes are private. Methods can be then public. I provide get and set methods to access and change these attributes. Right? If I'm making those, those variables private, which means that they can't be used outside of the class, how are we going to set values in them? Well, we have a method to do that. That way we're setting in a very controlled way. If I wanted to, for example, I could look at the cost of the meal. And if the cost of the meal wasn't greater than zero, I could throw some kind of exception. Right? You know, what, your meal costs negative $100 so you get to rob the waiter for, for 20 bucks? No, it doesn't make sense, right? By making the attributes private, I have to go through a method to manipulate them. And then I can put any kind of error checking or validation or exception throwing that I want to in there. Again, in this case, I'm taking the easy way out and just setting the variable. And then lastly, I have the calculation that looks at the level of service and does the calculation and returns the value. Questions? What I want to do next time, and we'll start this today, but look at the other tip calculator, their tip calculator. Because they do some things the same way I did, but they also do some things differently. And let's take a look at that. And it would be great if you could look at the code in the tip calculator prior to coming to class on Thursday. Oh, I unplugged my device. No wonder. 
I do have Android devices, by the way, that if you want to use and you do not have an Android device, I can, I can let you use it for lab or, or whatever. Just talk to me after class concerning that. All right, let's go and let's try the tip calculator again. Pick my, my device and run it. Here we have a little more involved thing. We don't have a button, but I, as I put in the value of the bill, it automatically does a computation of the tip and the total at the 10%, 15%, and 20% level. There's also a slider control where I can say, hmm, maybe it was better than 10%, but not quite as good for 15%. So I can slide it in and say, all right, let's give them a 13% tip, and it will show me the value. Now, when we look at this, we'll see a lot of the things that we saw before. All those strings are going to be in a string. It's going to have a layout, all right? That layout's going to be a little different because you notice there's a lot more going on in this layout. There appears to be nesting of things, all right, possibly. Or actually, I don't think there's nesting in this particular case. But um, it is a more involved layout. And there's also going to be listeners involved, all right? But we don't have click listeners, right? Because we're not dealing with a button that clicks. We have a listener on the text edit or the edit text can, uh, view that looks to see if anything has changed. And we also have a listener on the slider control. So those are the things that we're going to uh, look at. Just very briefly to look at this, kind of hit the high point so that when you look at this uh, between now and Thursday, um, you, you kind of know um, what to look for. And again, we'll talk about this in much more detail. In this particular case, notice that our layout is a table layout, right? We have rows and columns, so that's different. Each table is, consists of, uh, or every table consists of a series of rows, and then controls or columns within those rows. rows. So notice that it's very similar HTML-wise, right? It's doing virtually the same thing. We have a table. Table has rows, rows has cells in it. Nothing too interesting in the strings file. It's a strings file just like any other one that we've seen in this class. Uh, so we won't spend too much time on that, but we will look at the uh, layout. What we will spend time on is this tip calculator and all it does to do its thing. Two things I want to point out, again, just to reinforce the concept, there is a lot of these find view by ID, and so on. You're going to be seeing a lot of those because that is our hook. That is our way to get access to the objects that are on the UI so that we can write code for them. The other thing that you will see as we scroll down a little bit will be we have a different way of creating a listener but we have a listener for the edit text and we have a listener for the seek bar text. So any code that waits for something to happen to respond to it is going to be a listener. All right, we have a button click listener, we have a text watch listener, and we have a seek bar change listener. So as you slide that seek bar. So these are things that you're going to be getting used to seeing because again, 
um, they're found really throughout the applications. Of course, you want applications so that when you do something, the application responds. Well, the application has to be listening for that to happen, has to be waiting or expecting it. And that's where these lis listener classes come in. Are there any questions over any of this? Take a look at that. We will um, review their tip calculator example in more detail next time. Questions? Questions in Ridgeville? Going once? You okay in Ridgeville? Okay. All right. Uh, do you have an Android device to test on? Okay. All right. So I don't need to send one out to you. If this works for you, Skype-wise, as far as seeing the screen better, we can do this uh, every week. In fact, you can do this in here if you have trouble seeing the screen up there. You know. So. All right. We'll see you on Thursday. Yeah. A setting on my, where would it be? Um, I don't think that's something I control. Uh, okay. Yeah, that would be, that would be, I think, something for them in the control room if you're hearing this. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, bye-bye. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's already up there. Well, I remember, and again, this might this might be this might be an urban legend, but I've heard.
Okay, is there another class in here tonight in PS105? Okay. Yeah. And PS105? Is it a... Uh, No, no, I, I, it's seven o'clock. You're right. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. That's, that's ready to go. I'm talking to you. One oh five. So it's, it's good. I can shut the room down. Okay, I got audio coming out of the receiver, so that's all I know. I don't know what the problem is. Okay. <coughs> 